anti-protein science debunked. Hey guys, new paper just published looking at protein intake and mortality, cancer mortality, and cardiovascular disease mortality. And this paper was really, really cool because not only did they look at these things using the NHANES data set, which is one of the largest data sets we have looking at dietary intake, and various health outcomes, but they also looked at it per five to 10 gram increment of protein intake, plant and animal protein intake, and levels of IGF-1, which a lot of anti-protein science out there says that protein is going to fuel cancer because it increases IGF-1 and that's gonna lead to more cancer. So I wanna go through this paper, but first we gotta go through a little bit of backstory. 11 years ago, there was a paper published in Cell, which is a scientific journal, and that paper concluded that protein increased your risk of mortality, drastically increased your risk of cancer mortality. Some of the news headlines were, high-protein diets are as bad for you as smoking. And the researchers made some pretty provocative statements. And there were researchers on that paper who I would consider anti-protein. At the time, a bunch of protein experts like Stu Phillips, my PhD advisor, Don Lehman, they wrote a letter to the editor of Cell. And in the letter to the editor, they asked several really important questions. The NHANES data set at the time contained mortality data on over 12,000 people. Without explanation, the authors of this paper eliminated almost half of that data set. Even then, the overall analysis of the data set was that protein intake had really no effect on mortality. But somehow this was hidden in a supplementary table. But in multiple sub-analyses, they found that in people over age 50, that apparently high protein diets increase the risk of mortality and cancer mortality and diabetes mortality. And my PhD advisor and these other researchers also questioned their seemingly arbitrary definitions of high, moderate, and low protein. The low protein group was under 10%, at, which is under 42 grams per day, which is frank protein deficient. The moderate group was 10 to 19%, and the high group was over 20%. Now, perhaps most interestingly, they did what was called a hazard ratio analysis on this data set. And if you look up how to do a hazard ratio analysis, it is appropriate when there are a similar number of subjects in each group. But the way that they put these low, moderate, and high groups together, there were drastically lower amounts of people in the low protein group compared to the other groups. This meant also that there were very low incident numbers. Now, of course, you're expressing as a percentage what the number of mortality and cancer incidents, but the problem is when you have a very low sample number, it can skew the data. If I pick out three people and I follow them and two of them die in five years, I can say that is a 67% mortality rate in this period of time. But it was a very small data set. How do I know that if that wasn't a sample of 10,000 people, that the mortality risk was actually closer to 10%? And what happened was I just happened to fall on two landmines. That is why you need large sets of data. And when you have small data sets, it can really present a skewed view because it increases the risk that you have random chance. And just to put this in perspective, you can kind of get an idea of how much variability there is in data when you look at confidence intervals. Now, a confidence interval is basically the probability that a data point will be within a 95% range. If all of the data is 100% of the range, 95% basically is 95% of that range. So you have 2.5% on the ends, which are considered, you know, quote-unquote outliers. So the confidence interval is the range of data that encapsulates 95% of the data points. So the, the tighter the confidence interval, the more reliable we can feel about the variability in the data. Then there's just not that much variability. And the confidence interval, for example, on the risk of mortality from protein in people with diabetes was like four to 70 something. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with nutritional research, that is the biggest confidence interval I have ever seen or heard of in any kind of research data. That suggests there is huge variability in that data. 
So there was a number of problems with this, this data set. This new paper has Stu Phillips on it. For my money, is the world's leading researcher on protein now that my PhD advisor is retired. Sorry, Stu, I'm just, you know, I'm just playing with you. Now, what they did was they took the full data set of over 15,000 people now in the NHANES data set, and they did not create arbitrary definitions of high, moderate, and low protein. They created a data set of usual protein intakes. So they had turtiles. Basically, what was the average and then what was one third of the highest intake and one third of the lowest intake. They created these kind of usual intakes and the distributions of those intakes so that they could have a relatively even data set so that it was an appropriate analysis using hazard ratios. Now, they also attempted to make their analysis better by using, and I'm going to read it straight up, the multivariate Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Now, I had to do some reading about this because it's essentially a way to help get ideas of usual dietary intake when you don't trust that the data set is complete. Basically, the paper from 11 years ago, that in Haynes data is based on one 24-hour dietary recall, which we know has a lot of problems. And so by doing this multivariate Monte Carlo method, it, it, it helps clean up the data a little bit and make it more reliable. So what were the results of this study? Well, the results were total animal and plant proteins had really no association with cancer mortality, cardiovascular disease mortality, and overall mortality. And actually animal proteins slightly reduced the risk of cancer mortality. And also IGF-1 levels had really no association with any of the mortality measures that they looked at. Now, some of the limitations of this are they weren't looking at high protein diets. They were looking at usual distributions of usual protein intakes. So this was basically anywhere from like around 60 grams of protein a day up to like just under 100 grams of protein a day. That's one thing to keep in mind. They weren't making claims about high protein diets, but they also looked at regressions in terms of like, is there a dose response? And they, they didn't see anything. The mortality data was pretty darn flat, except for animal protein and cancer mortality, which had a slightly protective effect on cancer mortality. Again, this is epidemiology. There's always the possibility, like say the protective effect of animal protein on cancer mortality. It could be that people who are more likely to survive cancer just tend to eat more animal protein. Or maybe they, people who survive cancer treatment or tolerate cancer treatment better have better appetites and can better take in animal protein. We don't know. Perhaps it is a protective effect. Uh, I think that there is benefits to animal protein, especially when it comes to like sarcopenia, and helping preventing muscle wasting, which may be protective for cancer mortality, but it's hard to draw those conclusions from this data set, and the effect wasn't super powerful either. They also did a sub-analysis where they looked at people over age 65, so 66 and up, and under age 65, and again, saw no differences between those groups, which again, if you compare it to that paper 11 years ago with a smaller data set that they did a sub-analysis on, there was if people that were older, this data set is more robust, and they did more appropriate statistical methods to actually test what they wanted to test. So again, I'm not making claims that like super high protein diets may not have some effects. We don't, we don't know that based on this data set. We can pretty confidently say that the paper that was published 11 years ago just doesn't make sense. And my PhD advisor had a phrase he liked to use, which is, if you torture the data enough, it will confess what you would like it to say. When you do sub-analysis after sub-analysis after sub-analysis and you eliminate random pieces of data, yeah, you might find some weird stuff. Doing a more robust analysis with more appropriate statistical methods, it doesn't appear in usual protein intakes that there is a risk for cancer. And it also doesn't appear that IGF-1 has an association with mortality, cancer mortality, or cardiovascular disease mortality. Now, the authors did point out that perhaps the effect of IGF-1 is parabolic. That is, at really low levels of IGF-1, perhaps it increases your risk of mortality, and at really high levels of IGF-1, perhaps it increases your risk of mortality. In the in between, there's kind of an optimal range. Additionally, it's important to point out that this was not looking at the incidence of cancer or the incidence of cardiovascular disease. This was just specifically your risk of dying from those diseases. So I can't make claims about the effects of uh, these protein intakes on the risk of getting cardiovascular disease or the risk of cancer, but my thoughts would probably fall somewhere in line with what they've seen here.
Additionally, it may surprise some people that plant protein did not appear to be more protective than animal protein. There are some studies out there showing that plant protein is more protective than animal protein. But I think one of the things to keep in mind is that is very much confounded by the fact that if you're eating more plant protein, you're eating more fiber by default. And as I've touched on many times, fiber has a very powerful, consistent effect on mortality, cancer mortality, and cardiovascular disease mortality. As I've touched on several times as well, there may be other compounds in plants that are also protective for cardiovascular disease and cancer and mortality. It could be less of an effect of the actual protein in the plant itself and more of the effect of everything that comes along for the ride. All right, guys, that's it for this week. I'll catch you next time.